And we can start. Uh, good afternoon. This is the program on constitutional government at Harvard. I'm Harvey Mansfield, and he we're here for a special program today as a memorial to Paul A. Cantor, our friend, a great uh, professor of English at the University of Virginia, a student at Harvard before that. Um, and we're, we've got a schedule of speakers uh, that will go alphabetically, short speeches, and uh, afterwards we hope to have time for, or we will have time for uh, others who want to chime in and, and, and say what they would like to say. So we're going to begin with uh, Mark Blitz from uh, Claremont McKenna College in California. I'd like each, each speaker to please introduce himself. Um, I'm Mark Blitz. I teach government at uh, Claremont McKenna College, and uh, I've known Paul since we were undergraduates many, many years ago. Um, you know, thanks to uh, Harvey and Andy and Anna and Bill for organizing this memorial. Um, I think that Paul was, was really characterized by a, a rare combination of breadth uh, together with precision. Now, the surface appearance uh, of this breadth was something of the sort I, I saw uh, the year that we roomed together in our first year in graduate school in 1966. Um, von Mises's human action was under his bed, but the television was always on. Uh, the careful study of the two dimensions of Rome and the deep knowledge of classical music were evident. Uh, but so also was the claim that the Beach Boys' new album, Pet Sounds, was somehow, God only knows how, a landmark in popular music or music generally. Uh, some of the depth behind Paul's breath uh, I think came from his ability to see the reasons behind what he disagreed with or agreed with only partially. So in his long essay on literary criticism and uh, spontaneous order, he understands Marxist criticism even while disagreeing with it. And he sees the links uh, through reversal as it were uh, between the new criticism and deconstructionism. Uh, Paul, of course, did not suffer fools gladly, but he often took the time to understand them, and his works are therefore armed with countless footnotes. Uh, some of the further depth behind Paul's understanding came from uh, his iconoclastic nature, his interest in Austrian economic views, his interest in Leo Strauss, uh, his seeing the links between popular and high culture. Uh, Paul was able to grasp and, and work with really the full expression of opposites, master and slave morality, Republican and imperial virtues and vices, Darwinian accident and intentionality, uh, while also seeing when appropriate their unity, uh, and the result is an understanding that most others did not reach. Um, behind even this depth, and maybe accounting also for the precision is in Paul's works, uh, was a, a true empiricism. Uh, Paul sought wide experiences in his travels. He actually looked at art. He tried to treat things and know things as they actually are. He did not pretend not to like uh, what he did like. So he once told uh, uh, Ellen and me at a Liberty Fund conference that we'd organized in Palm Springs, that one of the nice restaurants we'd picked had served the best meal he'd ever had at a Liberty Fund conference. High praise indeed. 
while also being happy with fried rice from the Hong Kong, which was one of the staples of our graduate school life. Paul was, was, I think, not intellectually ideological, so that he did not let a theory or an intellectual hope warp his view. If Hegel's understanding of tragedy is superior to Aristotle's, so be it. If Nietzsche's understanding of master and slave is superior to Hegel's, so be it. Uh, Paul sought to see things a whole range of things in their truth. Uh, and of course, he had the mind, the intellect to do this, which enabled him to see what he saw about Shakespeare, about art, about culture, about romanticism, uh, about philosophy, and about literary criticism. So I think these gifts uh, and this range of knowledge and concerns made Paul inimitable. And of course, uh, in a sense that's also true of each one of us, he's irreplaceable and we will miss him. Thank you, Mark. Um, so now John Briggs. I appreciate the invitation to be here. It is one thing to remember someone. It is another to recognize that person's self still sustaining presence in one's life, even concerning many things that had no connection with uh, that person. Paul Cantor's influence on me, as I guess it was and continues to be on many of those who knew him, was more than an influence. Reading back over his letters and contemplating the legacy of his public writings, I am in the presence of a man who cared a great deal about his students' scholarly and personal lives, especially about their most exploratory aspirations and ideas, and who sought to encourage and sometimes deftly refine and question those things for the good of his students' quests. This description falls far short of what one witnessed in his lectures and writings, and often in conversation. There, one saw demonstrated a world of people and ideas that steadily brought forth rich grounds for observation and the making of telling questions. There were always compelling topics to discuss, authors and students to engage, and especially a desire to pursue what was going on where philosophy and mundane experience interacted. In the teeming Brooklyn of his imagination, that interaction could become discoverable almost anywhere. I met Paul Cantor early in 1969, as I was preparing to write my senior thesis on Shakespeare as an undergraduate English major at Harvard College. He was a graduate student in the midst of writing his dissertation and leading discussion sections in the English survey. He was the first person I ever heard use the word bizarre in a not entirely negative or censorious sense. For him, it described something easily taken for granted that was in fact off kilter, worthy of skepticism, yet potentially of great interest. Under his influence, this seemed to be the case with many aspects of the high literature and philosophy we were discussing, just as it was true of Paul's references to what we now call popular culture. The bizarre might truly be bizarre, but it somehow was related to deep ordering principles or could be in human life. Telling one of these from the other became an attractive challenge for me. There was something exciting and down to earth in Paul's teaching. Insofar as it reached toward higher things, it was grounded in everyday life. We are now familiar with the Cantor bibliography mixing high-end pursuits with love of B movies and the burgeoning world of television drama. For him, the two worlds and the two times of life, early youth, life at Harvard, adulthood, were of a piece. They enriched each other. When I first met Paul, I had almost lost touch with the high and low I had studied and experienced in my own life. Sitting in his section one day, there came a moment I remember with particular clarity. I found myself saying to myself, 
distinctly a six word phrase I did not know I had that was unaffectedly humorous, observant. Uh, I'm sorry, I've skipped. <laughs> and the phrase was, he was giving me back the world. I sensed a window opening before me, and from that point, it did not close. The narrow horizon of throwaway irony, sarcasm, and self-justifying moral outrage that prevailed in much of my adolescent and college experience began to open. What could be seen beyond my old horizon would take a long time to sort out. As I listened and began to participate in more discussions, something more particular was happening too. Paul's manner and meaning ignored or overcame many articles of faith and prevailing literary criticism. He was uninhibited in his discussion of character and motivation. He simply ignored the prevailing doctrine of the new criticism, although he knew certainly what it was and used it, that significant interpretations should avoid the slightest tendency to know anything about literary characters as human beings capable of intention or purpose or in possession of an inner life that was more than the immediate literary evidence might seem to indicate. And this Paul reminded me of my favorite literary critic when I was in high school, the old fashioned AC Bradley, <clears throat> whom the new critics had cast into the outer darkness. <clears throat> in later years, we have witnessed how Paul consistently assumed and repeatedly dared to try his hand at demonstrating that Shakespeare was far more than a historical figure, an interesting genius bounded by his era. Paul knew Shakespeare as a reader of the ancients and a playwright of the human condition. It even seemed possible to understand him as a type of Socrates, a man of a city who was not incidentally a philosopher. To understand Socrates and Shakespeare in these terms meant understanding what it meant to be an embodied soul, a political man capable of shadowing forth higher truths. The more I studied these two figures, the more I could appreciate my luck in working with Paul. In the dialogues, lectures, and, and uh, uh, conversations that followed, I began to get a better sense of the vastness of human possibility, especially its capacity for tyranny, and the formative powers of the city, which could develop citizens' capacity to govern themselves, even to better become better versions of themselves. After my graduation, Paul stayed in touch, I am sure as he did with many of his students for many years. I came to know his support unfailing, even 30, 40 years after our first meeting. And I came to know his ability to smite an opponent with a sharpshooter's wise crack or a courteous, carefully researched refutation. But whatever my record in that respect, he was magnanimous and even indulgent, always ready to write a letter, offer a friendly criticism, supply encouragement, recommend further reading, ask me to rethink. I am guessing many of us heard or sense that Paul always wanted to be a comedy writer, at least in a parallel life. Many years ago, he wrote four scenes as a collaborator as a collaborating author for a comedy that opened on the Chicago stage on its first night in the space used by Second City. When the new play moved to a marginal theater and disappeared, Paul let it be known with self-effacing humor that it had closed almost immediately. The joke was on him, as he put it, but one could see that the experience had been exhilarating and it hardly diminished his love of that art. It offered him a unique opportunity to observe from his position in the audience, he said, whether his jokes and comical scenes made the audience laugh, success or failure, the result was refreshingly immediate. Paul enjoyed the discipline of the arena. Isn't this what we see when we watch his YouTube lectures? He loved the immersive experience in a marketplace of ideas. It was an encounter in the theater's trading floor. In that teeming setting, a good joke, a series of well-conceived comic scenes offered freedom and release. 
Paul's humor thrived on breaking boundaries, and yet its energy and clarifying power depended upon its ability to work within challenging limits. And his humor and much else uh, accompanied his being a solitary thinker. It also propelled his creativity. I'm sure that I'm not the only one who knew he often subjected himself and his writings to the labor of intense, repeated rounds of revision. Once I heard him describe this process as an agon, even though I knew he took pride in his speed as an editor of his own work. If it was a struggle, it yielded a way of engaging his audiences, especially the most difficult audiences. Paul's writing and lecturing could be almost whimsical, but it also had the force and grip of a smiling, often unpredictable wrestler. It seems no accident that later in life, he spent a good deal of time watching and writing about the knockdown choreography of, world, of the World Wrestling Federation. It is fitting that Paul's pantheon of problematic yet fascinating histories and uh, heroes included a special class of characters from science fiction, movies, and westerns. Two of the most interesting being characters he admired for their powers of persuasion under difficult circumstances. Several were notable collaborators as well as creators of innovative ideas. <clears throat> in Paul's words, they could change the genres in which they worked. Two of them, not incidentally, were known to have occasionally shown their rough edges. He's thinking about Captain Kirk of Star Trek and Paladin of Have Gun Will Travel. They could drop persuasion and draw a gun or a photon por torpedo, as the case may be, to make their persuasion work. But these were flaws, he indicated, that might lead to tragedy. Paul admired these people because, and the directors who created them, because their creativity and their daring were capable of reimagining their circumstances and in fact, enlarging the context of their stories. They could transform the genres and professional circumstances that framed their work. The two directors Paul highlights thrived on immersing themselves in limiting circumstances. They created novel and significant contributions to their craft. What Paul says with admiration about the sci-fi director, Tim Burton, is an indirect reflection upon his own teaching and scholarship. And I'll end with just a few quotes from what he says there. Burton, as everyone remembers, is the director of the what Paul called the wacky masterpiece, Mars Attacks. Burton, he says, felt that he needed limitations to bring out his creativity. In Burton's words, it's almost like humans need boundaries. The creative imagination needs to be in a framework. It needs to be held in check with other elements. For me, there's no such thing as unlimited resources in movies. You need boundaries. Paul admired Burton in part because, quote, unlike many creative artists, he acknowledges that checks on his imagination be, may almost be as important as the freedom to express it. Tim Burton is a model of creative innovation for Paul, who draws strength from collaboration. In Paul's words, quote, Burton does not like playing the role of an autocrat or a director. He does not insist on having a movie perfectly planned out in advance. <clears throat> he embraces the often chaotic working conditions in the film business, which accords with the anarchic spirit of his masterpiece, Mars Attacks. Whether in life or art, Burton likes to see things shaken up. I'll quote one last passage in Paul's commentary that is suggestive of his own accomplishment. This is what he says about Burton again. As in all the arts, creative freedom in Hollywood is not absolute, but a matter of working within artistic traditions and reshaping them in one's own vision. His love-hate, Burton's love-hate relationship with the flying saucer genre tells us something about creativity in popular cultures.
genuine artists are not overwhelmed by their sources, he said. They triumph over prior works by reimagining them. I read this passage on Paul's website again and read his lecture on Nietzsche. One gets the sense that this fan of sci-fi and Shakespeare would have been a good guide for Nietzsche if that philosopher had ever embarked on a curative holiday to Hollywood's dream factory. But there is a deeper philosophical significance in Paul's example because it offers a form of redemption or at least renewal for all the romantic heroes he studied who were haunted by tradition, but the traditions they had left behind and the contradictions of their rootless attempts at self-overcoming. There is much more to say about Paul, and I know other guests will uh, fill these things in magnificently. Thanks to his contributions, Paul's readers will be more likely to immerse themselves in a significant number of works and traditions. They are more likely to form and sustain their own collaborations, see things more clearly for themselves, and see them anew. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Paul Cantor as a tour guide for Nietzsche at Universal Studios. That's a Coen Brothers movie in the making right there. That's wonderful. Um, Doug Hoffman will come next. Okay. Uh, before I introduce myself, I want to continue along the line John Briggs uh, started with regard to Paul's uh, talking about Paul's sense of humor, his sense for the comic, and a sense for an understanding of comedy. Paul's humor was quirky eclectic and situational. He didn't tell jokes. He, he drew humor from the present context by making unusual connections, often to far-flung things. For example, here is an epitaph he wrote. In memory of my devoted VCR, Sony SLV 420, July 20, 1994 to December 29, 2000 without which this book could not have been written. Tragically, within three months of the completion of this manuscript, the gallant machine passed away while attempting to record 18 hours of a Star Trek marathon on the sci-fi channel. That's Paul's dedication of his book, Gilligan Unbound, Pop Culture in the Age of Globalization. As Wilson Carey McWilliams says of it, Cantor sees the serious dimension of ostensibly trivial things and the trivial and the ostensibly serious. Paul could also write to suit. At my request, he wrote a comically pedantic footnote for one of my undergraduate papers. While himself an English graduate student, Paul wrote up a graduate student as a game show prize, mimicking the way features of a car are described on such a show. Paul also had a way with titles from Gilligan's Unbound. Shakespeare in the original Klingon, Star Trek and the End of History. The importance of being odd headed his brilliant essay on the Norwegian representational artist, Odd Nerdrum, whom Paul considered the greatest living artist. There's only one time I remember Paul being at a loss for words. He was visiting me and my family shortly after I had become partner in an international law firm. Our son was three years old. He knew I was a lawyer, but of course did not know what a lawyer was. For some reason, uh, Paul asked him, what's the difference between a doctor and a lawyer? Our son shot back, a lawyer makes you sick and a doctor makes you well. Paul had no answer to that. 
as for Paul's understanding of comedy, watch his conversation with Bill Crystal entitled Shakespeare and Comedy. The topics covered are far broader than its title would indicate. Paul explains how Shakespeare drew upon ancient comedy and approved, improved upon it, as well as how he profoundly influenced subsequent comedy. Paul noted Shakespeare wrote only love comedies. Paul explains how Shakespeare used his comedies to transform the understanding of love. To that end, Paul concisely gives a history of the understanding of love. Starting with some terse comments by Strauss, Paul gives a grand overview of the relation between comedy and tragedy, how comedy presupposes tragedy, and why both are needed to present the fullness of human nature. In short, Paul conveys great insights into comedy, tragedy, and love in little over an hour with excellent questions and contributions from Bill Crystal. Paul's other conversations with Bill are also worth viewing. Also visit paulcanter.io to experience the breadth of Paul's books, essays, lectures, and courses. Now I want to turn to my relationship with Paul. In a less dramatic way, I was for him the man who shot Liberty Valance, for I am the man who introduced Paul Cantor to Harvey Mansfield. Paul went on to learn more from Harvey than I did and use what he learned to alter profoundly our understanding of Shakespeare as a political thinker. I am also, I believe, the man who had the longest continuous friendship with Paul, seven years together in Cambridge and long distance thereafter for over 51 years. We met at Harvard as sophomores in the fall of 63. Although a year and a day older than Paul, I consider myself to have been the junior in our friendship. When we pursued an interest together, I was happy to let him take the lead. I was in a way, Paul's first student. We first met in the Lowell House dining room where discussions lasted hours and ranged over topics from the sublime to the ridiculous. Among the latter were what today we call pop culture. In retrospect, I see a line connecting those discussions to what Paul later did to show us how the Simpsons fostered family values. I'm justified in drawing that line because as an undergraduate, Paul had already plotted the trajectory of his academic career. He knew that at some point he would use Austrian economics in his writing. He did not then know he would apply it to popular culture. He knew that toward the end of his career, he would write something about Nietzsche. He did not then know that he would do so in his last Shakespeare book to convince his readers that these two greats shared certain thought insights and that comparing them would illuminate the thoughts of both. I suspect that most of you do not know that Paul had an athletic career. He tried out for the Harvard fencing team. He proved too large and slow moving a target to actually win a match, but he mastered the art of fencing in his mind. After that, he let the sports his students and friends pursued determine which sports he mind mastered. In fact, if I had to choose a single epithet to describe him, it would be Paul Cantor, master of arts. Besides the arts of literature and political philosophy, Paul mastered the visual arts and classical music as well as film, TV, and selected rock music. It helped that Paul had a prodigious memory, carried around the contents of all the major museums of Europe and North America in his head. Paul could also tell you, in order, the 10 best recorded performances of many symphonies 
and Chamber Works. It used that performance insight to spot talented artists to book for the UVA Chamber Music series before they became famous and expensive. When he wrote about the cultural meaning of zombie films, he had watched and retained every zombie film. The living dead lived in Paul's mind. Yes, Paul was a bachelor, but even so, how did he have time to absorb and retain all this and much more? Uh, he had a secret master art, multitasking. The invention of the CD, video recording, and cable TV enabled him to perfect that art. Whenever Paul read a book or wrote a lecture or an essay, he also listened to a classical CD and watched a video. Every time Paul evaluated a classical CD for me, I knew he had listened to it while, say, reading Heidegger and watching Breaking Bad and he had taken them all in perceptively. Paul had his mind running on three tracks simultaneously. Because we had joining birthdays, October 24 and 25, Paul and I had an annual joint birthday call. In our last one, I pointed out that uh, we both lived in townhouses and our ability to climb stairs would not last forever. I broached the prospect of independent living facilities. He immediately rejected the idea. I countered that with his wit, knowledge, and lecturing talent, he would be the hit of any such facility. Paul parried, you don't understand. I hate people. Paul Cantor, a loyal and supportive friend to a number of us, hated people. I knew what he meant. He hated being constrained to associate with a random group of people. He wanted to relate to people who shared his interests and concerns. Well, Paul dodged the independent living bullet. He died with his academic boots on, teaching a course in a seminar. He was writing about the shark tank and rereading Moby Dick for the first time since high school. Who knows what music and videos were playing as he did so. Paul had a John Wayne tough mind and a John Wayne sized generosity as a friend. He befriended not just me, but my wife, son and daughter as well. His death on Friday, February 25, brought the end of a beautiful friendship. The next morning, my wife and I had our usual Saturday morning Zoom with our three-year-old granddaughter half a continent away. She started by saying, Mama, Mrs. Paul, she cried. Did you cry too? We said, yes, we cried too. We then would have started crying again, except that we had a job to do. We had to read her a book entitled how to hide a lion. As time goes by, I'll miss you, Paul. We will all miss you, Paul, as time goes by. Thank you. What a wonderful tribute. Um, thank you, Doug. Um, the next one is Peter Hoffney. Thank you. Uh, I've known Paul or knew Paul for 20 years. I was his student uh, at the University of Virginia um, and really sat at the edge of my seat. Every one of his lectures, I think I took almost every class that he taught. And then I stayed in Charlottesville. So, uh, so fortunate to spend a lot of time with him after graduation. Um, and I've worked as a high school teacher uh, for my entire career. So I want to begin just by thanking Harvey Mansfield, Bill Crystal, and Andy Zwick, as well as the Foundation for Constitutional Government for recording and promoting Paul's lectures and conversations the past decade. 
you know, from his lectures uh, on Shakespeare to his delightful conversations with Bill Crystal on topics ranging from Greek tragedy to television, Paul's ideas and scholarship have been shared with tens of thousands of people around the world. Um, and really, you know, since his death, it's also served as a place for his friends to go to spend time with him again uh, and delight in his love of the arts and culture. I recently listened to um, the conversation that Bill Crystal reposted, um, and this is the introduction, his, his first conversation on Shakespeare. And really, this is possibly one of the best introdu introductions to Shakespeare anywhere. In his last remark, uh, made with a sweet little chuckle, Paul said in reference to Shakespeare's genius, quote, he understood everybody. He understood everybody. A simple remark that might capture Paul's love of Shakespeare as well as our love for Paul perfectly. The way Paul felt about Shakespeare is the way I feel about Paul. He seemed to understand everything and everybody. And like Shakespeare, had the ability to communicate this to an audience beautifully and clearly in his lectures, his writings, and his conversations. From Virgil's Aeneas to Shakespeare's Hamlet, from Vito Corleone and Coppola's Godfather to Walter White and Breaking Bad, Paul understood people, their virtues, their vices, their triumphs, and their failures. His profound understanding of these characters was the result of meeting the characters where they are, paying attention not only to their actions, but the time and place of their actions. From Hamlet's inability to take revenge to Walter White's decision to become a drug lord, Paul looked at each character's decisions through a lens that took into account their unique external pressures whether it was the clash of the classical and the Christian traditions or the challenges of the old world versus the new world for the immigrant, Paul examined the cultural, political, and spiritual pressures on the back of every character and used this to inform his interpretation of them. He understood everybody because he learned as much about the world around the character as he did the character himself. This made him a great scholar. This also made him a great friend and a great teacher. Paul was a remarkable friend. He became genuinely interested in his friend's passions, hobbies, careers, and families. When I first became friends with Paul as an undergraduate, I was fascinated by his stories about all of his friends and buddies. He told me about Michael Moses's high school career as a debater and how this made him one of the best writers at Harvard. He gave me play-by-plays of Jack Jackson's swim meets at UVA and his record-setting butterfly performance at the ACC's. He explained in detail about Doug Hoffman's son Frey's music video with the rapper Kanye West. He told me stories about Harvey Mansfield's classes at Harvard, not only about his brilliant lectures, but also about how he dressed in a three-piece suit that always fit perfectly. Paul took the time to learn everything he could about the worlds of his friends, so he could champion them in their pursuits, guide them in their challenges, and celebrate them in their victories. He, like Shakespeare, understood everybody because he was passionate about their lives. This quality made Paul a master teacher as well. It is a given that Paul was a master of the subjects he taught. His knowledge in most areas of literature, economics, music, film, and television is unmatched. However, he combined this mastery with an ability to connect with his students by introducing ideas and topics in terms that were relevant to them. Whether this was using current events, pop culture, sport analogies, Paul knew his audience and he knew how to explain complex topics in a manner that was approachable, 
and relevant. He cared about his audience, both in his writing and in his lectures. He really did care about his students. In the book, Educating a Prince, Essays in Honor of Harvey Mansfield, edited by Mark Blitz and Bill Crystal, Paul contributed an essay on Shakespeare's Henry V. Thinking about the success of the English king, Henry V, it is easy to draw parallels between him and Paul Kanner. Henry V, or Prince Hal in the earlier plays, is successful because he can move chameleon-like between different worlds. He is as comfortable hanging out in East Cheap in an East Cheap tavern as he is leading the charge in the Battle of Agincourt. He can be a pious Christian king in one scene and a pagan-like hero in the next. He moves seamlessly from one world to the next. It is why he is not a tragic hero. He is not caught between two goods. Rather, he embraces both goods and uses them to his advantage. Paul, like Henry V, moved effortlessly in life from what most would consider high culture to what many would consider low or base. He was happy and comfortable eating in a five-star French restaurant in the south of France, as he was getting a four for four deal at Arby's on 29 North in Charlottesville. He took joy in Wagner's ring cycle and joy in WWF wrestling. He listened to Vivaldi while watching Pawn Stars. He had a bust of William Shakespeare on his bookcase on the same shelf as a bust of Homer, Homer Simpson that is. In Henry V, Prince Hal takes pride in being able to call all the lads of East Cheap by their Christian names. For him, this was a virtue. Paul took pride in knowing all the episodes of the X-Files. Shakespeare's character, Henry V, used his knowledge of high and low to become England's greatest king. Paul Kanner used his knowledge of high and low in culture to become one of the greatest scholars and thinkers of our time. He also used it to introduce scholarship to new audiences by taking pop culture seriously. Paul, like Henry V, was a leader and a leader who left the court of scholars and went into the crowd of Hulk Hogan fans to educate himself. The one thread that ran throughout his intellectual life was a determination to figure out what things mean. Through all the twists and turns of his inquiries, he was guided by a desire to understand the many ways that human creativity manifests itself, whether in a platonic dialogue, a Shakespeare play, a Wagner opera, a Dickens novel, a Vermeer painting, or a TV cartoon. Paul enjoyed epic poetry, especially Homer's Iliad and the great hero Achilles. He often used Achilles as a reference point when analyzing other characters. In particular, he liked to compare his favorite Shakespeare character, Coriolanus, to Achilles. Both Achilles and Coriolanus are the best and know it. Both have zero reservations about speaking their minds. Both stand up for what they believe in. Both have a unique form of excellence, what the ancient Greeks called arete. Paul once jokingly told Bill Crystal in a conversation that, <clears throat> I like these characters because I am attracted to the opposite of what I am. When looking back at Paul's career, he had a lot more in common with these heroes than he gave himself credit for. Much like Achilles and Coriolanus, Paul displayed excellence, not on the battlefield, but instead as a teacher, writer, thinker, and friend. Much like Achilles and Coriolanus, Paul trained and practiced in order to perform at his best when lecturing. Most did not know that Paul approached lecturing much like an athlete approaches a competition. I had the pleasure of hanging out with him before and after some of his big lectures. He got into the zone ahead of time. He avoided eating before a big lecture and he prepared just like an athlete. After a successful lecture, Paul often celebrated like an athlete. He didn't throw his arms in the air or beat his chest, but he would joyfully go over the lecture like an athlete talking about the best moments on the field. 
Paul had a unique form of excellence. The ringing plains of Troy were the canvas for Achilles' excellence to be displayed. The lecture halls of Harvard and UVA were the canvas for Paul to display his. He was the best of the best as a thinker, a teacher, and most importantly, as a friend. Paul taught me all about heroes in literature. However, in the end, Paul is the hero I admire the most. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. That was amazing. And the best pitch for certain people to never marry and have kids that I've ever heard. <laughs> and lead the fullest life. Um, Bill Crystal is the next person. Please, Bill. Thanks, Anna. I'm, uh, I met Paul when I was an undergraduate at Harvard in the early 1970s. And Paul was, I guess, finishing up grad school, but an assistant professor for most of the time. Then I went to grad school and he was still there as an assistant professor for a few years. We knew each other some then. I admired him, of course. I took one course from him. Uh, I think my first year in grad school on, if I recall correctly, Bacon, Hobbes, and Swift. It was uh, really a political philosophy course masquerading as an English department course on you know 17th and 18th century British literature. I still remember writing a extremely mediocre paper showing that Jonathan Swift wasn't entirely sincere in his praise of the Church of England, which somehow I... I don't think even I then thought that was a particularly brilliant uh, uh, dis, you know, discovery about Swift, but, um, but Paul gave me a decent grade, and so I was grateful for that. As we were friendly then, and I'll come back to those years, but I really did have the pleasure, and this is kind of unusual, usually one makes friends young and just time and circumstances and distance and age leads one to know them less well as the years go by, so to speak. But in this, in my case, I had the opposite experience with Paul. Uh, in the lab, I got to know him much better in the last two decades than I had before. We'd always been friendly. I'd always been an admirer of his. We were totally, you know, we'd had occasion to see each other in just the same city for conferences or conventions or other reasons. He'd come to DC a, a bit. But uh, in the last couple of decades, he started to write quite often for the Weekly Standard, which uh, allowed me to be in touch with him and allowed me to also avoid actually editing him, which I did not want to be in the, I, I delegated that to my, the editors of the back of the book to deal with his, he was rather particular as he should be, as he should have been about his prose and didn't seem to understand that not every piece could be run at the exact length that he wrote it and so forth. So, but nonetheless, Paul and I stayed friendly through that experience. And more importantly, um, more importantly, but in addition, he started coming to Washington much, much more uh, thanks to the Hertog uh, Foundation summer courses, which he was very active in and often taught a whole week of. And then Hudson Institute had its courses too. And I was tangentially involved in both. And so I would see him when he was in town. And then when Andy and I started the Foundation for Constitutional Government to supplement this program of constitutional government that we're now yeah, involved, that we're on screen for um, in one of 2013, 14, whenever that was. We, Paul did the conversations that people have mentioned, and um, and those were in person until the last couple of years of, of, of the pandemic. So I, he would always come to DC and we'd have dinner before or after or both. And uh, and also uh, we did the website of Shakespeare's Politics for, for our uh, Great Thinkers series, and that involved a lot of work with Paul. So I got to know him, just spend much more time with him, um, both in person and, uh, and in, a, in the studio and in the last couple of years on Zoom than I had before. And that, that's really, a, I say, a great uh, gift, really a blessing that I, I cherish. It was not due to any great plan of mine, but it was um, he was such a, uh, obviously a lively and fun and interesting companion that I, I felt that, that I always admired his work, but I felt that the, on the personal side, I got to know him better so, over the last couple of decades. And as I said, that's not always the case with people. Uh, it's more often the one, unfortunately, again, just because of time and distance slightly drifts away from people. So that I'm very grateful for. Um, I will, I have many fond memories of all these different conversations and dinners and his enthusiasm about coming from the National Gallery and telling me about the pluses and minuses of a show and, uh, et cetera. But actually my sharpest memory of Paul, and you know, memory is so funny. One has so many memories of people and they're, they sort of blur and they're court friendly or they're not friendly, but 
I have this one really vivid kind of photographic memory of Paul. Uh, and that is from when I was in grad school and he was an assistant professor. And it was when a group of us, maybe a half dozen, I'd say, maybe undergraduates and grad students, went to the Boston Garden with Paul to watch a worldwide wrestling uh, match. Since Paul was a great wrestling aficionado, as people have mentioned, and we, I, I had actually watched wrestling as a kid in New York on Channel Nine, I think, in, in the '60s, but I had never been to a match. And uh, then really occurred to me that Paul would actually go to one, but Paul was more daring, and so we all went together. Uh, and I, I have just this photographic, almost memory of this one moment. Which I'll come back to in a second. I remember the. I don't remember, of course, all the wrestlers. I remember that the final match was a Texas death match with world uh, champion Bruno San Martino defending his crown, a great favorite in Boston uh, uh, at the time, San Martino. And so I think they did. And I was, I couldn't remember, um, you know, we could go exactly when this was. I assumed it was sometime when if you put Paul's, you know, uh, uh, biography together with the years I was there, it must have been between about 73 and 77. But it turns out, I should have realized this, of course, that if you Google uh, world, Worldwide Wrestling Entertainment, WWE has excellent uh, excellent website with very exhaustive uh, uh, lists of sort of uh, different events. And if you just look for Bruno San Martino and Boston Garden and Texas Deathmatch, you, I discover now that this moment that I have such a vivid memory of was on December 4th, 1975 at the Boston Garden where Bruno San Martino defended his title against Bobby Duncan with a special guest referee, Gorilla Monsoon. So that was an exciting moment for, for, for all of us to be there. My memory is this, that um, so Paul was a great expert and proud of his knowledge of wrestling and proud of his understanding of how the whole thing worked as an entertainment, as a show, as a spectacle, as a drama. And so I remember very much in the early matches, Paul would explain things to us. You know, they're going to have the bad guy win this match to kind of get you annoyed. Then they'll have the good guy win the next match. And they'll be this, you know, they'll, they'll have a fake blood in this third match to kind of get things, you know, spice things up a little bit. I remember very well once he once said something about uh, look at the side of the ring. There are, you know, fake timekeepers and so forth there, judges, I guess. Uh, and he said they're, they're moving their chairs away from the ring, and sure, they were as you know as the wrestling was going on in the ring. And Paul said that means they're gonna one of them is gonna get thrown out of the ring in that direction. And they're, they of course it's all staged, and so they're moving the chairs out of the way so they don't you know get 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 hurt or you know messed up by this fellow flying out of the ring. And sure enough, twenty seconds later, uh, one of the wrestlers comes out of the ring right to where the chairs have been vacated. So Paul was taking great pride in his sort of uh, ability to teach us about wrestling and his uh, knowledge and experience and analytical ability about wrestling. And so we go through, there are like a lot of matches. I noticed this on the world. I, I vaguely remember this, but if you look at the WWE site, there are about eight matches or something in, in one of these evenings, get your money's worth. And I remember, um, so this went on through the whole evening. And then the last match was the Texas death match with Bruno San Martino. And Paul Anilak kept on, you know, analyzing that. They'll have, Bruno's going to win. They're not going to let him lose the title in Boston Garden. Uh, but it'll be, of course, he'll look like he's losing and the other guy will be cheating and Bruno will have some heroic effort to come back. And, and sure enough, it went in that direction, as I recall. And then, right, and then about 15 minutes in, Bruno looks like he's about to be vanquished and he reverses it. And he suddenly is defeating this bad guy he's, he's wrestling. And I remember turning, I still remember this, Paul was, I was seated next to Paul, so in the, you know, in the stands, we had a few seats and he, he turning to my left to Paul to say, yeah, well, you were right. I mean, the, this is exactly how it's happening. And Paul was not seated, however. Paul was standing along with 15,000 other people in Boston Garden at that point, uh, who were all screaming, Bruno to the death. And Paul was not observing everyone doing this as much. Well, he was doing that too, but he was actually himself, uh, you know, pounding his, putting his fist in the air and chanting Bruno to the death. And I still remember them being kind of, well, thinking, well, for all that dispassionate analysis and ironic detachment that Paul had about wrestling, he was also a fan of wrestling. 
And I remember, you know, telling the story afterwards to my wife, Susan, and we all laughed about it. And I think I even, and I said to Paul later on, yeah, you were really kind of into that victory of Bruno. And he said, sure, you've got to enjoy it at the same time that you observe it. And I think that's very characteristic of Paul. I mean, maybe this is a cousin to, to Mark Blitz's comment that Paul combined breadth and precision. It's a little different. I'd say he combined enthusiasm on the one hand, engagement and enthusiasm, and a kind of you know sense of irony and detachment uh, and analytical ability, obviously, on the other. And usually people have one or the other, one or the other, I would say, or tend to have more strength in one or or the other of those compartments of life, or or sometimes sacrifice one for the other at different times in their lives. I could I can think of my own of doing that myself. You know, you get too wrapped up, too engaged in a political fight, let's say, and you lose a little bit of the detachment you should have, or conversely, you are too detached to see what's at stake. But Paul really, and I think this does also inform his understanding of literature and of uh, political philosophy and, and art, combined in a very unusual way, uh, genuine enthusiasm, engagement, and uh, in a non-ironic way on the one hand, which is, I think, very important to appreciate things and understand things, but on the other hand, also, of course, had a sense of, of irony and detachment and uh, 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 distance on the things that he was uh, enthusiastic about. And, and he really could go back and forth from those two or balance those two. In his in his work, but also in his own character and his soul, uh, in a way that's very unusual, and without doing and doing justice to both of them, I think that's the most one can balance the two. But often it's at the cost of either of them. And he was a true, a true enthusiast, a true fan, and uh, and therefore it excited about things that could convey that excitement, but also had a certain sense of distance and, and understanding, uh, uh, which also he, he conveyed so well. Thank you, Bill. Not, n- none of us is going to forget Bruno to the death <laughs> now either. And I once asked um, Paul why he went to the symphony almost every night that he was here in Boston with us. And he said something along the lines of, where would a man like me go? Where else would a man like me go to cry his heart out? And it was it was similarly striking and is to your point. Um, so now it's Harvey's time. Um, all right, Harvey Mansum. I'm a, I'm a Harvard professor. No, Paul Cantor, very well. Fat Jewish boy. That's how Paul Cantor once described himself in my hearing. I think by that he meant uh, to describe the the limits to success in his life, and perhaps they were. But uh, he lived very happily within them. He was fat, but that he indulged himself in the pleasures of the table you know, without any dietary restrictions. He was the favorite of my wives, uh, and Anna and uh, Delba, who uh, cooked for him and uh, took care of him. He was also something of a wine bibber. So a decent fraction of my wine collection uh, went down his welcoming gullet <laughs> to his uh, pleasure. Um, he always, at the table, he always made sure that he was served. If his glass was empty, he wouldn't mind reaching across the table for the bottle and to fill it up again in case of an unattentive host, as sometimes happened. He was not rich. So he couldn't afford the best wines, but he was grateful for the very good ones that he got at least from me. He was a great guest. He had no family life. My late wife Delba um, had a project to find a woman for him. And she she often said, uh, he has an awful lot to offer to any woman who enjoys lively company. But he and she never found one, and I'm not sure that he ever looked. He was at home with himself. And being at home with himself, he was at home on the road, and so he easily took to travel. He went everywhere. 
He was happy and cheerful. I don't think I ever saw him depressed. Where he went, he went for art and for music. He was a specialist in the efficient viewing of museums. He was learned in both art and music. He had, um, he had his own way. His first trip to Paris came fairly late in life. Where did he go? Where did he go first? Well, France, at its greatest, has a love of glory. So Paul went first to the tomb of Napoleon. <laughs> that was yeah, the most outstanding sight, and he wanted to see it first. He was my student. And like the best of my students, he went way beyond me. And, um, but he came to me with an unlikely opinion and a hero, a certain baggage. Uh, he had, as a high school student, gone to hear lectures by Ludwig von Mises, the Austrian economist. And he never lost or abandoned uh, this rival conception to everything that he learned later. Um, von Mises uh, believes or uh, believed in the spontaneous order of the market. No plan, no intention, no conscious ordering of the whole. Spontaneous, order comes spontaneously. It's a result of a multitude of choices, suggests the wisdom of a multitude. All this came to Paul when he was, uh, when he was in high school. But then he came to Harvard and he came to my course. He was in a tutorial group that I had with famous names. Uh, the course that I taught, and the, he, he mentioned it uh, um, in, a, in a recent uh, autobiographical, autobiographical remark, uh, uh, was titled Government 112C. <laughs> that, that designation actually meant something that, that because there was Government 112A and B, and those were two courses taught through the year by Sam Beer, who was my hero. And the 112C, that indicated my love for Sam Beer, but also a certain dis distancing from his teaching, not to say a certain correcting of what he said. And the fundamental idea that Paul said he got from Gov112C was the idea of the regime in Aristotle. Well, this is something that all of us has picked up from Leo Strauss. And I think Paul and I both uh, so, um, were, were, were Straussians in our way. And he was a dominant uh, and guiding figure in our thoughtful lives. But I think Paul was, is the only Straussian ever to admire Ludwig von Mos Mos uh, Mises. <laughs> Now, Aristotle, in his notion of regime, spoke of rule. Rule seems to be the opposite of spontaneous orders, order. And this is, uh, one could say, uh, the problem of Paul's intellectual life. He never doubted that spontaneous order could be reconciled with Aristotle's regime. <laughs> And the regime, what does a regime show you? It shows you what is universal, and it shows you this in the context of a way of life. So, which is, in, which is uh, the notion of rule. Rule, politics is responsible for a way of life. Politics stands for something universal, but when you make it a way of life, you, are, you give it a context. And he applied this notion of regime to Shakespeare. Take, for example, his understanding of Macbeth. Macbeth is about ambition, human ambition. 
That's a universal question. But Shakespeare, and Paul saw this, emphasized this, saw ambition in the context of early Scotland, early Scotland, uh, pagan Scotland on the way to being Christian Scotland. The pagans and the Christians have a very different view or outlook on ambition. Human glory, the pagan view, and human pride in the sense of uh, human sinfulness in the Christian view. Paul was aware of many literary critics, and he read them, but he departed from them. Some of them knew how to be universal, and some knew how to speak in the context, but nobody saw both. It reminds me of Tocqueville's democracy in America. There are many theorists of democracy, and there are many students of America, but it's only Tocqueville who saw democracy in America. So Paul never wrote a book. He wrote a book, uh, or, or, uh, never wrote a book about all of Shakespeare. He could have done that. He wrote books on the Roman plays. He had all of Shakespeare figured out, so he said. So you have those now and the wonderful lectures uh, that you can see in YouTube, um, which have been furnished by Andy Zwick and the, Consti uh, the, and the um, Foundation on Constitutional Government. He made two or three visits to Harvard and um, gave a semester course on Shakespeare in each of them, in which he pretty much covered all of Shakespeare. He gave three lectures for each uh, play. You should watch them. You can get them. When you watch them, get the text that, that uh, Paul uses and look at the passages that he describes. So you can take your time and pause it to see what he's, the points that he's making and, uh, and how he makes them. Shakespeare was his life's work, his mastery. But he was not austere and remote, a mere specialist or a mere professor, as everyone has spoken so far has, uh, has informed us. His mind was at work wherever he went. And it was at work for whatever distraction or recreation he took. His mind was at work and unlike others, <laughs> who might also think about these things, he actually wrote it down. In my office, I have a collection of off prints. That's something like my collection of wine in the cellar. Off prints, uh, now obsolete feature of academic, uh, of the academic profession because you can get any article that's ever been written now easily from um, a library and read it online. But I have these off prints and I've been going through them recently, throwing them out mostly, keeping a few. And I came to a huge, <laughs> a huge thing, a uh, container uh, with the letter C on the front. And that turned out to be all Paul. And so I, I picked out a few, and I'm going to end by reading some of the titles of these, uh, of these off prints that Paul sent me. Hyperinflation and Hyperreality, Thomas Mann in the Light of Austrian Economics, Stephen Greenblatt's New Historicist Vision, What Made the Sauerstadt Go Sour? Churchill and the Irish Question in the World Crisis. The Uncanonical Dante, The Divine Comedy and Islamic Philosophy. Leo Strauss and Contemporary Hermeneutics.
fields of glory, the absurdist anti-politics of W.C. Fields. That's one from the Weekly Standard. Othello, the erring barbarian among the super subtle Venetians. The invisible man with the invisible hand. H.G. Wells' critique of capitalism. The man without qualities, the democratic utopia of Gill Gilligan's Island. Pro wrestling and the end of history. Another one for the Weekly Standard. Stoning the Romance, the ideological critique of 19th century literature. I think, I think there was a movie called Romancing the Stone. And uh, another one, this is, this is just uh, a quarter of the, at best of the, of the collection I have. The Poet as Economist, Shelley's Critique of Paper Money and the British National Debt. There you are for Paul Ken. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you. That was great. Yes, and he um, he charmed me by saying my vegetables were the only ones he ever liked to eat, which maybe wasn't true, but he did eat them because they were nicely roasted and caramelized. So now we have Michael Moses next. Hello, it's great to see everybody here. Uh, I'm Michael Valdez Moses. I was a student of Paul's. Uh, I met him at Harvard. I'll say something about that uh, in a moment. Um, I taught in the English and film pro English department and comparative literature program at Duke University for 30 years and was able to keep in touch with Paul while I was in Durham. Uh, I've since become an emeritus professor there and I'm now a professor of literature and humanities at Chapman University in California, where I teach for the Smith Institute for Political Economy and Philosophy, as well as the Business School and the Dodd School of Film and Media Arts. Um, I met Paul uh, in the first week of September in 1975, the first day I attended class. He was lecturing in a course called Humanities 118, Myths of Creation, which later became the basis of his book, Creature and Creator. And to be quite honest, it was a day that really transformed and I think determined the rest of my life. I know I wouldn't be doing what I am today were it not for that meeting with Paul. I, I've had inspiring teachers before, but new to me. Uh, it's a cliche to say that Paul represents the life of the mind, but I know Paul would both laugh and be pleased to hear that I found him in the classroom to represent something not only ideal, but also noble, even heroic. And the stakes were high. It wasn't that Paul necessarily represented physical courage, his career as a Harvard fencer notwithstanding, um, but he had something really distinctive. Um, he had something that I think Alan Bloom would call a soul with yearning. And he represented thinking, thinking courageously as a way of being in the world. And I'd never really seen that before. And it was utterly gripping and completely inspiring. As Peter Huffnagel has said before, the thing about Paul was that he represented a form of excellence, uh, a particular form of virtue that I would call intellectual courage. I think it's always been rare for anyone to possess that even more so um, in the years that Paul taught, wrote, and lectured. Um, I don't think it was uh, merely coincidental that 
one of the texts that Paul taught in the course that I took with him in 1975 was Nietzsche's Homer's Contest. And he had a different relationship, I think, with philosophy and thinking than perhaps, well, certainly than Plato did. It wasn't a, a, an erotic attraction to something beyond. Eros was less a uh, part of it than Thumos. Uh, Paul was pugnacious in the classroom. He was aggressive and competitive. He liked Aegon and the struggle. Uh, and he liked to choose his opponents uh, joyfully, carefully, and occasionally even maliciously. Um, he made really significant intellectual contributions um, to American letters, even to world letters. Uh, by the end of his life, Paul was one of the preeminent literary critics in the United States. Uh, a small group of individuals that I would compare him with, Harold Bloom, Stanley Fish, Stephen Greenblatt. And I think it's part because of Paul's uniquely iconoclastic, highly individual and very distinctive approach to all of the academic topics that he took up. Um, he really just did not respect the normal rules or protocols or particularly the intellectual fashions in literary criticism. He was always his own man. Um, and he was, as I said, aggressive, pugnacious, even hubristic in his willingness to combine different disciplines together in a unique fashion at a time when that was really just not done at all. So his approach to literary and cultural criticism was rigorously formal. Uh, it was historically based but he also had an intimate knowledge of other fields and other disciplines that was extraordinarily rare for a literary critic of his time. Uh, he had mastered certainly the history of political philosophy as so many people here have attested. He had a deep knowledge of economics, particularly Otto Ben Bavirk, Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek. And those ideas, I think, penetrated and enriched his lectures on a variety of literary and cultural subjects, not least of all uh, Shakespeare, as evidenced by the really fantastic and wonderful lectures that he gave for the Foundation for Constitutional Government and that are now so popular on YouTube. But Paul's knowledge wasn't just limited to sort of academic fields, as, as so many people here have uh, testified. He had a deep knowledge of the history of Western art, especially painting, but also sculpture and architecture, a deep love and extraordinary memory of Western classical music. And they deeply enriched all of his lectures, his writings, uh, his essays. But I think finally, one of the things that was most distinctive was just Paul's what I would call American love of popular culture. He was just as comfortable talking about television, popular entertainment, films. You know, he was, I think, equally at home talking about Shakespeare and Salman Rushdie or Sam Beckett. King Lear, King Kong and the Klingons, uh, Hegel and Homer, and I mean Homer Simpson in particular. Um, he found all of the Marx brothers utterly hilarious, Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and especially Carl, which was one of Paul's great loves. He was equally comfortable talking about John Ford, the 17th century English dramatist, as well as John Ford, the Irish American director of so many great Westerns. And he could talk about 
Friedrich von Hayek just as easily as Florin Henkel von Dunnersmark, the director of the lives of others. Paul had an amazing ability to manage, and I would say orchestrate like a conductor or a composer, conversations among all of the poets, the filmmakers and the painters, the shows, performers and musicians that he loved. And he was able to put the high and the low in conversation with one another and made them, I think, the richer and the more profound for that interchange and conversation among them. I've been asked at times what Paul might have done if he hadn't become a literary and a cultural critic. And Paul always wanted to be the best at whatever he did. Um, I think Doug has talked uh, a good deal about uh, Paul's brief career as a Harvard fencer with an unblemished record of defeats. And he once told me a story about his final match in which both he and his opponent were both penalized for a failure to engage one another. Paul lost that match and his coach, a Hungarian Olympic champion who put his arm around him and said, Cantor, I keep you around for ballast. So Paul knew he was not going to be an Olympic fencer. As uh, others, I think Mark Blitz mentioned, uh, you know, he aspired to be a comedy writer. And indeed, one of the sketches that he wrote at Harvard, at least one line of one sketch, one day, one evening, made it onto Saturday Night Live. And Paul couldn't have been more thrilled. He wanted to be a classical pianist, but as he pointed out to me, he most admired Sviatoslav Richter, who had enormous hands, and Paul said, I, I was born with these, and held up his fingers. But perhaps the, the career that's known that Paul might have pursued desire when he was young and in high school to be a chess master, and I was actually quite surprised by that. Uh, it didn't surprise me that he would love chess, but that he had aspired to it. He said, yeah, you know, I was really good in Paul's inimitable way. And he said, you know, I was captain of the high school chess team in Brooklyn. You know, we won all of our tournaments. And so I decided to go to uh, one of the big, you know, kind of local tournaments for high school students and this other kid from Brooklyn just like, you know, wiped me out. It was like eight moves and, the, and you know, the chess match was over. So I played him two more times and it just got worse. And he said, at that point, I just realized that, you know, there was no possibility that I was ever going to be a grandmaster in chess if some kid from Brooklyn can, you know, kick my butt. And so I said, did, did you ever have any regrets? I mean, did you want to at least continue to play chess? And he said, yeah, you know, years later, I'm watching television and they're actually broadcasting a match of, from of all places, Reykjavik, Iceland. And he says, and there was that kid from Brooklyn, Bobby Fisher. So it gives you a sense of the kinds of standards and the norms of excellence that Paul established for himself. I know that he would have liked to be called a Renaissance man. And so I will name him that. But I think he's perhaps going to be best remembered as a rare kind of type that Tocqueville describes, perhaps indirectly, something distinctive that the United States has produced. I think Paul possessed what I would call an American genius. Every day, 
I miss, admire, and love him more. And I know that I'll not see or know his like again. Thank you, Michael. That was beautiful. And now we have Andy to Andy Swick to end our list of speakers. The other day I was thinking about Paul. I went to the bookshelf and opened The Invisible Hand in Popular Culture. There I read his inscription. To Andy Zwick, my friend, an executive producer of my television show. It got me to thinking that I was fortunate to know Paul, not just as a friend, but as a star. As a friend, I enjoyed knowing Paul, the enthusiast. He liked that I was in business and always was interested in talking about the details of commerce and about markets. We often spoke about subjects like New York in the 20th century, prohibition, bootleggers, con men, blues and folk music, gangsters and their adversaries, the G-man Paul disdained, you know, for getting in the way of ambitious entrepreneurs. Today, I want to talk about Paul, the star. Paul was a proponent of online media in its first strivings for publishing in the free market of the world wide web. Paul could see the great opportunity to do an end run around conventional publishers and universities to reach students and others directly. Nearly a decade ago, when Bill and I invited Paul to be on one of the first episodes of Conversations, it was a session we looked forward to. And we didn't know to what degree our experience with Paul would compare and contrast with other guests. You see, Paul wanted to be a TV star, and he was a natural. Paul was a wonderful teacher, and there's a connection, I think, between what made him so distinctive and attractive in front of a classroom and how natural it was for Paul to be in front of the camera on conversations. Paul reveled in the studio production from banter with the makeup artist, comparing notes about how makeup was used to different effects in TV and movies, to our three camera setup. Paul said, classic. That's the way they shot the early sitcoms like I Love Lucy. Three cameras. He loved the clapboard, as in take two, and enjoyed telling the crew, I'm one take canter. And he was. Paul said Bill was the best interviewer because he knew what to ask, what to add, and how to let his guests have the spotlight. So for Paul, it was my television show. Paul also was a dedicated viewer and fan of conversations, especially episodes featuring present company. But he was not hesitant to share critical commentary on the program and its guests where he saw fit. Oh, that Keynesian. Every great studio in the heyday of the Hollywood system 
had a Devo for whom everything had to be just right. Paul was ours. There were special protocols among the conversations production team members for Paul's episodes. Paul was very respectful of the crew's expertise and he was watching every detail, which was both encouraging and intimidating. We also had the great pleasure of working with Paul on the Shakespeare and Politics website in our Great Thinkers series. You can see it at paulcantor.io and at shakespeareandpolitics.org. The centerpiece of the site is his video programming. In addition to the conversations, the two lecture courses Paul taught as a visiting faculty member of the Program on Constitutional Government at Harvard and a seminar in the Hertog Political Studies Program. The development of the site all was overseen by close friends of ours, close friends of Paul's, volunteers. Sometimes it felt a little like being a freshman research assistant again. And no member of the team wanted to be associated with errors that upset him. Once Paul commented on a long transcript, just copy edited over many hours. This is pretty well done. Was this AI? There were fewer than 100 errors. This was a compliment. So we had a system. I'd show the draft of a web page to Paul without mentioning who had prepared it. When Paul praised the draft, I'd get to say, we're appreciative to Susan Hamilton for her hard work on this. If Paul expressed displeasure, the responsible party remained anonymous. And there were interns working for us who were quietly reassigned to other projects. As others have mentioned, Paul's conversations, lectures, and seminar are on YouTube, more than 100 hours available to all. Paul followed and enjoyed the high view counts, which he could see rise in real time. And he received quite a lot of fan mail, many memorable, and I'll read just a few lines. From a fan in Cape Town, you have changed my life. Daily, I listen to your podcasts. You have elucidated Shakespeare for me. In conversations with Bill Crystal on the Roman plays, Christian plays, history, comedies, and tragedies, and politics. From a teacher in Hamburg, know that you have changed my life forever. And Paul loved it when fans would write things like, they found him far more insightful than Harold Bloom. These emails were frequent and Paul replied to them all. It delighted him that the audience was worldwide and growing. One of the last times we were together after filming in the studio, I congratulated Paul on the session and thanked him for doing it. He thanked us and said, it's my immortality. Paul, I miss you. And on behalf of your legions of fans online, you're changing lives. Indeed, thank you, Andy. That was wonderful. and. We can, we, we're all showing that we're not up to snuff because we weren't, while watching this tribute, this wonderful tribute to Paul, we weren't also watching the new episodes of Saul in the background and listening to Richard Strauss live at the Met. 
in the background. We just can't do it. Um, so now um, we are opening this up to people in the audience, of which there are many. Thank you for coming. And if you would like to say something, share some anecdotes or something, some insights you've learned from Paul, you're very welcome to um, go ahead and mute yourself or raise your hand and we can call on you. Yes, Ryan, go ahead. Hi, um, Brian Schinkel, uh, very stirring tributes, everyone. Um, I knew uh, Professor Cantor um, uh, through the Hertog political studies program uh, back in 2015. Uh, he lectured to us for uh, five days on uh, Shakespeare's three Roman plays. Uh, I just wanted to share something um, uh, in uh uh, there's a passage from Shakespeare's Politics where um, uh, Bloom has this line, uh, what is essentially human is revealed in the extreme and we understand better through what we might be. In a way, the spectators live more truly when they are watching a Shakespearean play in their daily lives, which are so much determined by the accidents of time and place. The political provides the framework in which the human can develop itself. It attracts the most interesting passions, the most interesting men. Um, I just thought that uh, this model of scholarship, of looking at Shakespeare's plays, but applied all across the humanities, um, uh, was uh, uh, best uh, encapsulated as living tradition. You know, by his, by Paul Professor Cantor's example, by his, uh, uh, by how he taught um, just as a person uh, con uh, constantly engaging with students, constantly engaging with people uh, who responded to his uh, online materials, uh, uh, showed the, the best of what a teacher can be to so many people in so many ways. Um, my only parting thought is that um, in a uh, 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 Intro to Thoughts of Machiavelli, Strauss talks about how the surface of things is the way to get to the heart of things. That's a good way of looking at popular culture, looking for the quality among the quantity, that there is good things from all sources. Uh, when we're sort of glutted with popular culture these days, he gave an example of trying to apply serious scholarship about what is best in portraying of human nobility and aspiration. And so anyway, and, and that, and he gave his own example of what that was like. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ryan. Michael, Moses, do you remember that one line of Paul's that made it onto SNL? Um, I think the line was um, actually two lines uh, for an absurd story. Once upon a time, there was a camel who learned to upholster furniture. <laughs> I see. So, yes, he got lucky that we made him a TV star, <laughs> Andy and Bill and Harvey instead. So we have... Um, No, this is not a question or a contribution. If I may say a word, I am Titus. I am a film critic. I did a number of podcasts with Paul Cantor on film and TV, and also on literature, on sources of modern mythology. I, uh, I, I should also take the moment to thank Mr. Crystal, who introduced me to Paul Cantor by email. This was wonderful. We spent many long hours and uh, and more time corresponding on Europe, especially on northern Italian cities, what the Renaissance was all about, and its strange contradictions of Catholicism and commerce. He was uh, charming and cutting, at least in private. I'm not sure I ever saw him say a bad word in public, but in private, his judgment was... Uh, uh, admirable, but not always quotable. Uh, like Ryan, I learned a lot from Paul about 
popular culture and the oddly philosophic bent uh, modern works of art have. It seems like, uh, I suppose it's because modern writers read philosophy, but perhaps it's also because people like Paul taught me to look at ordinary events and figure out why would people really care? What is the fundamental principle involved in a conflict? And why we are, I think he thought of pop culture as some kind of uh, open secret in modern world where everything we're afraid to say comes out. We, it's, it's a, he thought of it as somehow um, a counter poison or at least an option out of utopian modern ideas. He liked, he took great joy in pointing out how much uh, horrifying stuff happens in The Godfather or for that matter in Macbeth. And he, he had a strange combination of joy in learning all these ugly things. And as Ryan said, uh, a deep interest in the noble. He liked to point out how many of these heroes are somehow European uh, images in left in America. Because the godfather with the Sicilian aristocracy is the most obvious, but there are, he, he found many other such examples. And I would say that's perhaps the part that didn't, the part of Paul that didn't gel so well with Austrian economics. He liked conflict. He liked the to see how human beings figure out that they can't get along, that the things they ultimately believe in drive them not merely to conflict, but perhaps even to self-destruction. But he had, I think, uh, and I think uh, Michael also spoke very well to this love of conflict of the argon in Paul, but I think there was, as Michael said, something joyful in it, something philosophic. He thought there's a lot to figure out when you see one of these heroes burn a city down. <laughs> it's instructive in one sense, at least. And uh, that's, I think, what I can say uh, right now. I tried to pay my debt to him in an orbit. And I would like to thank you now for uh, these wonderful speeches. It was Good to hear people who knew him, of course, for much longer uh, speak to his uh, mischief-making wit. Thank you, Titus. That was very welcome that you introduced yourself and spoke. Anybody else? Anybody want to speak on the more on the riddle of of the love of conflict and um, also this deep belief in the goodness of human nature that he would have arguments at our dinner table over this. <laughs> that all the libertarians we know have this, have these two sides, that they're deep, deep mentions and deeply believe and somehow human goodness, but they're also the ones that, that love conflict and that take on everyone who disagrees. Who else is still here? Yeah, Jerry. You have to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm on Jerry Weinberger here. Um, I wanted to just uh, relate uh, an, a brief account of my first um, conversation with Paul. I didn't know him until I got to graduate school and we recognized each other from Harvey's class. Uh, I was, I, we ran into each other in Harvard Square. And um, so I was telling him about my background and he was telling me about his background. And it, they were really quite opposite, uh, a Jew from New York and a Jew from the rural central California Valley in, Cali in uh, California. And we discovered to our mutual surprise that we had both spent quite a number of um, hours in our high school years at the wrestling matches. And contrary to Harvey's experience about how you get caught up in the wrestling matches, where we went to see the wrestling matches, people believed it they really thought it was real and they 
got into fights because the wrestlers, especially um, Haystacks Calhoun, um, would egg on the crowd by calling them pencil-necked Okies and Mexican trash. And there were fights and people would beat each other up with the chairs. And <laughs> um, so I was, we were both astonished to find that we both knew who Haystacks Calhoun was. And um, th that in fact, um, people actually believed it. Thank you. Are there more of Paul's wrestling anecdotes? <laughs> Did anyone ever go to the symphony with Paul? No. <laughs> you did, Michael. I mean, our, our speakers, you know, are people who have, have um, given a tribute. They're welcome to speak off the cuff again. Oh, oh, oh wait. I have one more point to make about Haystacks Calhoun. He was such an interesting character because he weighed, uh, they advertised his weight at 601 pounds. Uh, his real weight was probably closer to 501 pounds. But he came, he came on the stage dressed in these enormous overalls and he had a long rope with a huge horseshoe on it. And he would swing it around like this at, at his opponents. And the matches, he always won because he would eventually get his opponent to fall down and then he would sit on him. And that was it. The referee would call it off in order to prevent an instant suffocation. <laughs> I uh, had an experience with Paul at, uh, at a concert that I remember. He was visiting in Chicago and uh, went to see a performance of a Bruckner symphony. The only seats available <laughs> were on the, on the stage. So we were seated right behind the brass section. And anybody who knows about Bruckner symphonies knows the bra brass are prominent and loud. And after that experience, uh, Paul said he'll never do another seat on stage uh, uh, concert. Well, you know, I can say something about uh, Paul's musical encyclopedic knowledge of, of both uh, popular and classical music because Paul was an honored and important member of the Tuesday Evening Concert Committee, uh, which determined who the performers would be uh, for the season. And that was a major event in the small town of Charlottesville. And the person who ran uh, the Tuesday Evening Concert Committee, a charming person, Karen, uh, it said that uh, she got all of her ideas essentially from privately from Paul, whose knowledge of performance uh, and different versions of uh, classical music was uh, quite encyclopedic. Uh, Karen Payon uh, uh, spoke at uh, our little service for Paul uh, in Charlottesville. And uh, I, and the only other thing I would say is that uh, it was certainly one of the best uh, uh, contributions I made in my brief period as, as uh, English department chairman at, uh, in, at UVA uh, was to invite Paul to come to our department. And uh, uh, he, was, he was a blessed, blessed presence here in Charlottesville and, and made a huge difference in, in everybody's life here. And so I, I'm glad to at least bring one element in my fading memories of everything these days. But uh, uh, Paul was uh, 
an, made an immense contribution to our community. Thank you, Professor Hirsch. And I do have one more story because it, it, it occurred to me as people were talking today, how much Paul just loved all kinds of live performances where there was something at risk. It connected his love of sports and professional wrestling, live music, uh, drama. I mean, he really lived for that, that excitement. He was totally in the moment and completely committed to it. And I think he also fancied himself something of an empresario, a kind of Diaghilev who could identify talent early. And, and he loved that. So I, I do have a story to tell. We were in London together. And Paul was just dragging me from, you know, to from one like completely obscure play after another, night after night for a week. We were sort of, you know, had exhausted everything. We were down to one obscure theater with a one man play about a 19th century Victorian Shakespearean actor who basically drank himself to death and died of drug addiction and was called Keen. So I think there were like five people in the whole audience, but it was mesmerizing. And Paul was going like, you're going to hear from this guy. You're going to hear from this guy. They said, the playwright said, no, the actor. Well, I think later when he was knighted, Ben Kingsley probably looked back to that early critical endorsement as the launch he needed in his career. I'll uh, uh, relate. This is uh, Mark Cordova. I was a student of Alan Bloom's and <coughs> Warner's at Cornell. Uh, about a few years ago, he and I had dinner in uh, Charlottesville, and he wanted to know what it is that I wanted to talk about. And at the time, uh, the reading group we have here in Washington, we were reading The Winter's Tale. So I said, well, we're reading The Winter's Tale and we really don't understand it very well. And in Paul's typical manner, he rather forcefully said, no, I will not talk about The Winter's Tale. And I said, okay, and then went on to explain, I don't understand it, and repeated himself, I will not talk about it. So I said, well, I heard that you're working on this TV series called Breaking Bad. And before the words came out of my mouth, he jumped on me and said, ah, oh, I know a lot about Breaking Bad. We can talk about that. And we had a wonderful dinner, uh, mostly me listening to his analysis of the play. He was teaching it at the same time. And then one other very quick anecdote. About a month before he left us, we had a fairly long conversation about his life, ironically. And as I'm sure all of you know, he thought that he had made a mistake in his career to have gotten a degree in English and gone on to become a professor of English. He said, I should have, I should have studied political philosophy. And somehow that turned into, and I'm, I'm certain he would have remembered, but I don't, a discussion about his childhood. And I asked him if he was happy as a child. And he said, no. And Oh, I, I, I'm actually remembering how this happened. I said, one of the things that may have come out of your study of English is an interest in popular culture. And he said, no, that's not how it happened. When I was a kid, I did nothing but watch television. And that's where it started, which I knew to be wrong because by the time he was 16, I think he'd read every single great work in the, in the great tradition of literature. But, but I then asked him if he was happy as a child, and he said no. And then there was a period of silence in which he was obviously thinking about his life, and he said, 
There was only one time in my life where I would say I was truly happy. And he said, that was when I was at Harvard studying with Harvey and the Straussians and teaching. And that is for many of you at any event, I think a good reflection of how Paul understood your friendship to which I think all of you did a wonderful job in responding. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. That was lovely too. So we leave it at that. Hmm. So we end on that beautiful note. Slightly sad note. All right. Thank you very much, everyone. It's been wonderful listening to you. Bye.